Hi folks, Denise Howell here. Welcome to 2011 and the first episode of This Week in Law for the New Year. We've got Graham Seifert here. He's helping defendants in BitTorrent suits. We've got Eric Gardner. He's writing about them. We've got Evan Brown. And we're all going to talk about the new net neutrality rules and what it takes to get at your cell phone by the police. All that and more next on Twill. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, recorded January 6, 2011. Convergent iPhone tasers. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management made simple. For 10% off your new domain, go to twill.hover.com. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off the lifetime of your new account, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TWILL. Hi there, folks. This is Denise Howell, and you've tuned in for This Week in Law. We're here in this week's episode, episode 93. We are all lawyers, and we all play them on the Internet. Uh, first joining us from the Hollywood Reporter Esquire is Eric Gardner. Eric, great to have you back. A happy New Year. It's great to be back. Happy New Year to you. Also returning to the show, Evan Brown. Oh, well, let's go to Graham Seifert then, our first timer. <laughs> <laughs> back to Graham. Hi, Graham. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's actually ciphered, but everybody gets that wrong, so it's not a problem. I meant to ask you before the show. Thanks for clearing that up. Graham Seifert is in Jacksonville, Florida. And then we also have Evan Brown. Hi, Evan. Hey, how's it going? It's great to see you again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Uh, so, guys, we've had a lot of stuff going on. We've had a couple of week hiatus for the holidays. Uh, one thing I wanted to get into, since we have both Graham and Eric on the show today, and uh, they have some special knowledge about this particular topic. Uh, Eric, why don't you bring us up to speed on the latest, your exclusive story on uh, the new uh, BitTorrent lawsuits, mass lawsuits against many, many BitTorrent defendants. Who Who is up to this now? Well, uh, if you remember last year, a, uh, an enterprising uh, DC firm, US Copyright Group, started representing a lot of independent producers and then signed up the producers of Hurt Locker and started bringing many of these uh, mass uh, lawsuits. Uh, they were soon followed by other firms uh, working on contingency, representing a lot of companies, particularly a lot of adult entertainment producers. Uh, now the U.S. Copyright Group is back, having signed up New Image Films, uh, which are the producers of The Expendables and, and nearly 180 other films, and they're planning on filing new lawsuits soon. Uh, some of the old lawsuits, uh, ha ha there's, there's been developments on that. A lot of the defendants in one of the cases, the Far Cry case, have been dropped. Um, but the U.S. Copyright Group says that they are intending to bring individual actions against some of the defendants uh, in uh, cases around the country. Uh, they have signed up about 15 local uh, firms uh, around the nation, and those firms will have discretion to uh, follow up with litigation against any of the defendants who did not settle uh, from the well, demand letters that were sent out. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that update. One of the people who's come up in your coverage of these cases, Eric, is our guest, Graham. Now it's Cypher, right? Cypher, that's right. Cypher, uh, got it. And yes. uh, Graham, is, Graham, you're a foreclosure lawyer by trade per your website, is that right? Uh, that's right. Defense? I mean, mainly I mainly I handle a lot of foreclosure defense. Uh, but I mean, just this morning I was in court doing foreclosure defense. Um, I handle a lot of landlord tenant things, just general things for general consumers, essentially, uh, is my practice area. But what I did in this particular instance is um, 
uh, created some self-help forms for people to download uh, and it, it, in order to basically fight the lawsuits. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's gotten me some attention uh, that uh, so, yes. I, I did. Tell us yes. about that, what the forms consist of, where they can be purchased, how much they are, and and what's happened since they've been available. Sure. Um, well, originally, I, I was actually watching an episode of Jersey Shore with my girlfriend. Um, she claims that she wasn't watching it, uh, and uh, it really got my mind thinking about other things. Uh, and I started thinking about all these people who were calling me up. Um, I signed up uh, to be on a list with the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. And um, basically, I was getting a lot of phone calls throughout the uh, uh, the the early stages of this litigation. I was getting lots of phone calls from people who just simply couldn't afford uh, to hire an attorney. And so I decided to create these legal forms. Um, the first form was a motion to quash, um, and it was supposed to quash the subpoenas uh, of the, uh, uh, in this case, the U.S. Copyright Group. Um, and, uh, you know, supposed to basically present an overall defense as well. I also included an affidavit of the general, uh, some other do did it defenses um, mm -hmm. for like you know other people getting on to other people's systems um, and essentially it is it's created a big uproar just for the simple fact that I, I think that innocent people can actually uh, use these forms at least to gather enough information to defend themselves from these suits well apparently I, I think the, that, uh, sorry go ahead is that Eric yes I, I think some explanation is in order about about mm -hmm. what what the, pro the process that's involved here, uh, what, what the U.S. Copyright Group is doing and, and what the uh, subpoena squashes really mean. The, uh, the U.S. Copyright Group has some sort of technology that allows them to, to see the IP addresses of who, of who is infringing. But that data in it, it of itself is not that interesting. So what they need to do is they file these mass lawsuits against anonymous John Doe's, and then they subpoena the ISPs like Time Warner or, or Comcast or Verizon or AT&T, and they, they want to get these ISPs to identify the customers who are using their IP addresses. Once the subpoenas go out, the, the ISPs are under an obligation to notify its, its consumers and give them a, an opportunity to squash the subpoena. And that's where the, 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 motion, the motion forms that Graham uh, ha, ha, are selling come, come into place. It's a, it's a way for, for those targeted John Doe's to, to step up and, and give reasons why uh, they should not be identified, why their information should not be handed over to, to plaintiff lawyers. Right. Uh, Graham, as a public service for anybody who's listening who may be subject to one of these lawsuits, since there are a lot of them floating about and more to come, uh, where can they get the forms? Uh, they could get the forms at my website, which is www cyphert.com. Uh, actually, I, I'm looking up there. It looks like uh, my uh, uh, domain name is misspelled. Um, that's okay, too, but uh, it, it's <laughs> just my last name.com will get you there. Um, okay. But I, I, I'm really telling people that they should go out and hire an attorney rather than buy my forms. But if they really need to do this, then they can go ahead and get them. Wonderful. Um, I, th I When Evan and I first heard about this, we thought, you know, what a brilliant idea, first of all, on your part. And secondly, what a great thing, what a great resource for uh, folks who uh, find themselves in this situation. Uh, Evan, have you ever um, heard of something like this where there was a, a, such an ability to serve the need of so many uh, defendants in such an, a cost-efficient way? Well, it, it is a, a good idea, um, it, if so long as it's executed well. I guess the closest thing I have had experience with directly is when I was actually uh, a new lawyer practicing out in Colorado. I practiced in Denver for a couple of years before I relocated to Chicago. And uh, like, like Graham, um, I represented a lot of uh, people involved in landlord-tenant disputes. So there are a number of good forms available uh, at least in Colorado, there was a company called Bradford Publishing out there that's, that's still around um, that had some, some great forms to mount some of the typical defenses that a tenant would have in a landlord-tenant dispute because that is a really 
Um, but that type of situation is one where the parties and their resources and availability uh, or their their access to, to legal counsel is very mismatched. If somebody's getting kicked out of their apartment for not paying the rent, they're certainly not in a very good position to be paying uh, legal fees and if their security deposits being wrongfully withheld. So suffice it to say, that's a good, uh, that's a situation where forms like this, uh, where the, the, the types of issues are rather fungible, each, each case is very similar one to the next, uh, a, a situation like that. So. Um, you know, I, I think in principle it, this is this is a, a good thing for for Graham to be to be doing something like this, and <clears throat> at the very least, it's provided a bit of entertainment to us all uh, <laughs> to see how uh, the the folks in Washington D.C. at the um, at US uh, Dunlap group. yeah yeah U.S. Yeah. Copyright Group Dunlap Grubb and Weaver uh, have responded to that, and I think there's some 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 uh, there's plenty of things that we can all learn from. From that whole uh, exchange and that whole that whole brouhaha that's uh, that's erupted. Yeah, right, absolutely. Uh, one of the things is that I should edit my emails before they go out. Although I did write it with the uh, the intention of making it actually vile enough. Uh, uh, painting them in a bad light and painting th me in a bad light too at the same time, uh, trying to do both of those things at the same time, uh, essentially so that they wouldn't publish it. But uh, it, I think it puts them in a worse light than it puts me. And really, I don't really care what anybody thinks about me. This is on a national level. Locally, everybody knows who I am. Um, and uh, you know, once again, you know, I can look back on emails and want to take them back, but you know. Uh, uh, well, let's no back one's up ever... a few clicks there, Graham, and, and, and <laughs> sure. give the context on that. So um, what happens when people can't defend themselves in law lawsuits and they don't have a ready-made set of forms that's tailored to some common issues that might come up in their, in their particular suit is they might wind up representing themselves. And having been opposite, and I'm sure every lawyer who goes to court has been in this situation where they've been opposite at one point or another, parties representing themselves without legal representation. It's not fun for anybody. The people don't know what they're doing. They're legally um, able to do this. You know, we have an open court system. You don't have to have a lawyer, but the court system is very complicated and it has lots of hoops to jump through. And what winds up happening is it's a lot more work for the courts. It's a lot more work for the lawyers on the other side. And it's a nightmare for the person who is trying to represent themselves. So it's not good in any conceivable situation. So one of the most uh, ironic things in this whole situation with you, Graham, is that U.S. Copyright Group has actually come after you, requested sanctions against you. That's a fine for people who are not uh, uh, con uh, conversant with the legal jingo, lingo. Um, and uh, that one of the things they're saying is that uh, these forms are so deficient that uh, they're making all kinds of extra work, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's bad enough when someone's representing themselves, but I guess they're saying you're actually making it worse. What's, uh, what's the situation with uh, the sanctions motions going back and forth? And, and uh, now tell us about your email as well. Uh, uh, okay, well, I, I haven't heard anything in specifics about, your, uh, uh, about any of the things that are actually happening with the sanction motions at, at this point. Um, you haven't been served? Uh, no, uh, it, effectively, the only thing that they really did is mailed me a copy, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they haven't really, you know, served me with real papers. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure quite what they're doing. Uh, basically, everybody has told me I didn't need to respond. I filed a response uh, in the mail, and I also sent a letter to the uh, judge in that case. I haven't gotten any response yet, um, but I'm not really, you know, um, worried about it uh, too batch, too much, you know. Um, but yeah, so I, I wrote an email um, basically telling them that, uh, well, they, they wrote me an email and actually phoned me, uh, you know, uh, one occasion, basically threatening me and telling me to stop selling the forms or else they're going to file sanctions against me. And uh, I told them that I didn't represent any of these people. They simply bought my forms. Uh, and then I told them that they can, uh, can, can we curse on this show? Uh, we'd prefer yeah. not to. We keep our okay. uh, clean tag in iTunes as well, much as we can. So, <laughs> well, can, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to dirty it up. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I don't pull punches in emails. And this guy was basically coming at me full bore on the phone. Uh, then he sent me an email calling everybody who bought my my forms a client. Um, and you, you know, you, you, and I just I basically went off 
um, and uh, sent an email that, uh, you know, I, it was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was funny. Um, and, uh, and that was the only really reason that I sent it. It was trying to make myself look crazy enough to, uh, uh, for them to leave me alone. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't really take much to their intimidation. Um, and I just really wanted to be left alone. I, I'm not representing anybody in these cases. Uh, when it goes local, I will. Mm -hmm. um, and I will be happy to. I've been waiting for that. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens when that rolls around. But you were talking about just the uh, when people represent themselves. With the foreclosure defense, um, basic principles is that everybody has a unique uh, case, but they, they all have similarities. Um, when, when I deal with foreclosure defense judges, they, they tell me that essentially, or with foreclosure judges, what they're telling me is that they wish that they could have a way to actually give out forms to people um, instead of having to deal with the letters that they get. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of judges appreciate that. I think that there's a judge out in West Virginia that would probably agree with that uh, that's also involved in these uh, cases. Um, I've heard good things out of West Virginia when it comes to using my forms. And if they're talking about uh, legal insufficiencies, um, the motion to quash has not been successful. Uh, I will you know, tell everybody that right Right now, every single motion to quash that uh, I have seen has been denied. But then again, there's uh, the judge has already issued, at least in that D.C. case, uh, the Hurt Locker case, or the Far Cry case, sorry. Um, the judge has issued a ruling saying that there's no um, uh, right to privacy in that, uh, you know, filing that motion to quash. So basically, there's really nothing you can do. Short of being in the witness protection program, right. uh, I'm not really sure, or, or hiring an attorney. Um, and I, there are still attorneys out there that are still protecting people's identities, but uh, uh, these forms basically just get them to leave you alone. Uh, and they include an affidavit basically saying, I didn't do it. Um, and they're targeting 5,000 people at a time. Uh, there's so many you know, people calling me up, um, you know, grandmothers who have the, the internet in their name. Um, had the neighborhood kids over or whatever, uh, and, and they don't have any way to really represent themselves. And, um, you know, that's one, that's one of the things that I was hoping uh, would, would happen with this. But, yeah, we are in a situation where everything is lining up, where everything, all the people um, have this same issue, except for the people who happen to be just unlucky enough not to be located um, or to be located in the place where they're suing, like the Texas, West Virginia. Um, there's some now in the Northern District of Illinois, mainly the pornography cases. And that's another, you know, time when they send you a demand letter for downloading some, uh, you know, transvestite type movie. Um, you know, it's an ultimate way of just basically pressuring you into giving them money. It's, it's, it's just not fair for a lot of people. Right. Uh, one last question about the forms. Do you include in, in the defense, I haven't looked at them myself yet, uh, do you include in the standard defenses you're, you're asserting there the uh, open Wi-Fi assertion that we have um, unlocked Wi-Fi and we're not sure um, who might come by and use the network? Is that something that has come up at all or is that left out? Uh, no, actually, in my affidavit, I not only have that in there, but also mm -hmm. people with WEP encryption, uh, WEP encryption, uh, which is vulnerable to attack. Um, so anybody who you know has that encryption could be vulnerable, and you know, and, and that's on there too. If you have right. WEP encryption and don't know where it came from, right? Got it. Um, Eric, are you uh, are you as as convinced as Graham seems to be that? Uh, the notion that one can hide behind uh, one's ISP in these cases is is going to fall at some point, that there's not really much anonymity there. Is that what you're seeing as well? Well, I think that, that these lawsuits initially are just intended to find the people with the IP addresses. And we can argue about, you know, whether the person who owns an IP address it is culpable for, for the actions on their network. Do they need to take uh, more steps to, to lock down their network to make sure that, that others who are using it uh, aren't committing copyright infringement? Uh, I, w I will say that, that um, 
that that the goal of of these lawsuits, at, at least at the initial stage, is just to find information, just to find out who uh, is behind the IP addresses. Uh, so, so questions lo like the one you presented about 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 maybe someone else is using uh, the I uh, the IP address. Those, those are uh, questions of liability, and I'm sure that will uh, you know happen at, at a trial down the, down the line when an individual is specifically targeted in a case. Uh, but at least at the, at, at the initial stage, um, the, the, the questions are more process questions uh, about, about, uh, about, you know, true, uh, whether joinder is, is right, whether jurisdiction is right. And the uh, the motions to to quash, uh, you know, have been filed on those grounds, and and as Graham says, they haven't been particularly successful um, right now. So I, I don't really anticipate that uh, anything is going to change right now. Although I, w I will say that in w in in West Virginia, in one of the porn cases, the the judge there didn't seem to like uh, these types of lawsuits at all, and and has thrown out pretty much all the defendants. So uh, West Virginia doesn't seem to be a very hospitable uh, venue for, for, for uh, copyright plaintiffs using this uh, mass suing technique. That's good to know. Uh, another uh, perhaps uh, reason to forum shop a bit if you are engaged in any of these nefarious activities, which I'm sure that none of the good listeners of this show would be. Um, Evan, any uh, last thoughts before we leave this topic? Um, no, I guess I just wanted to revisit, you know, a, a issue that I had kind of implicitly brought up about, you know, whether or not the, this whole kind of scenario with what Graham has done, you know, is executed uh, properly here. And, and I guess, you know, I'm one to say, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. So I don't want to be too critical or, or too, um, well, critical, I guess, is the word of what what Graham, you know, you've done on this. But I mean, th th this has been far from a, a lesson in in good uh, civility and, and professionalism. I really kind of regret how the whole thing went down with with Dunlap, Gra uh, Grub, and Weaver. And, and as best as I can see from an outside observer here, it really just. I uh, hope we don't lose our iTunes uh, clean tag for me saying this, but it, it just mm -hmm. seemed to devolve into a pissing match between you and and Dunlap Grubb and, and Weaver. That's, that, and, that's exactly right, yes. It, yeah, and, you know, so I just would would say, um, you know, I, I hope that if we're going to take on a, a noble cause and to try to, you know, actually, try, for one, try to help people, you know, at the consumer level, which obviously, you know, judging by your practice, you're very committed uh, to doing, to, to representing the, the little guy in all of this. Um, but also even the larger issues of due process and, you know, the, the questions for the integrity of how, what it means to properly form a strategy either in prosecuting or defending an intellectual property infringement case. I just hope that we can all uh, make sure that we, we don't get into these pissing matches and then let our egos get the best of us so that everybody ends up with, with egg on their face and, and it kind of lowers the, the potential for there being real progress and meaningful um, you know, ways of, of going forward with this. So again, I'm not trying to, uh, trying to uh, accuse you of doing anything <laughs> that, that you shouldn't have done or whatever, but uh, I'm just, uh, I just think uh, there's some interesting civility uh, lessons to be learned from, from how, all of that, uh, how all of that went down. Uh, th there is, and uh, and I definitely agree with that. And I, I've definitely been, uh, uh, you know, scolded by a number of my colleagues for for doing it that way. Um, and it, and it was a time when uh, you know I had a lot of things going on. I was uh, going to be moving on, um, you know, basically. Uh, I wasn't going to be moving on to a new firm, but I was having a lot of problems in the firm that I was at, uh, and uh, I was deciding to leave. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if I could have taken it back, I would have. Uh, as far as doing good, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I, I, you know, if, if that holds it back, I'll, I'll be very uh, disappointed in myself. Right. It's a good lesson in what we talk about a lot on the show, which is that... Uh, communications that we're used to being uh, sort of behind closed doors or not necessarily private but not wildly public um, as soon as you commit them to bits and bytes uh, are out there <laughs> and that's what uh, seems to have happened here 
Um, I want to get into uh, the net neutrality rules that were enacted and a lot more um, folks trying to get into your cell phone and email and the like and some rule, new rules that have come down on those kinds of issues. Uh, but first, I want to thank one of our sponsors for the show, and that is Squarespace. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog. I love this service. I use this service for my bag and baggage blog. Um, it's super easy to use. I love its UI. It's clean. It's intuitive. It's optimized for beginners and CSS experts and everyone in between. It has lots and lots of beautiful designs that are right there for you to use, or you can customize it to your heart's content. It's all inclusive for a really reasonable monthly fee starting at $12.99. There are modules that you can use to build your site, with, which include blogs, forums, form builders, uh, photos. It's wonderful for displaying photos, uh, Google Maps, and more. Uh, the search engine tweaks and the stats that you see are really informative and helpful. There's an iPhone app that makes it great for use on the road. And uh, it's really great for all your website needs, whether it's a really sophisticated business or I'm thinking of uh, setting up one for our local Boy Scout pack because it's so reasonably priced and uh, everyone wants to get together and, and connect online and they don't yet have a way to do that. So Squarespace is great to fill in um, those gaps either for a big sophisticated user or um, a small group. So if you do decide to use it, use offer code TWIL and you'll get 10% off the lifetime of your new account. Before you do that, just try it out. You don't need a credit card. Kick the tires. You'll like it. I guarantee you. That's squarespace.com. Thank you so much for sponsoring the show. So uh, back on December 21st, guys, the FCC finally enacted its uh, net neutrality pronouncements. And it seems like since then, People either love it or hate it. Actually, the hate seems to be pretty prevalent on both sides of the political spectrum. I haven't really heard too much about a lot of love coming this way. Um, Evan, what is uh, the deal here? What are the actual parameters and what's your take on it? Well, I, I think the biggest one is that, you know, it, the fact that the FCC has actually said something on this. There's been this great... Um, well, there's always been a little bit of doubt, and then that doubt was actually reinforced as to, you know, the FCC's abil ability to regulate the Internet in this way coming after the, the Comcast case from, from last year where the court held that the FCC didn't really have much business. I, I'm vastly overstating it. But mm -hmm. so the FCC has, um, you know, implemented these new rules that, uh, you know, they're on, on December 21st. And the big thing is, is that uh, they're there is this requirement or this prohibition against content blocking by major internet service providers. So that really is, I guess, the most important thing about network neutrality, not uh, discriminating against one type of content versus another. And then there's a certain, you know, transparency on the part of the ISPs about how uh, transparency requirement about how they're, they're managing traffic on the network and, and all of that stuff. Um, and so um, the, I think what the big, concerns are as to how this doesn't go far enough or maybe, you know, goes too far. But I, it's, it's more easy, at least from my uh, sensibilities, to, to recognize where this may not go far enough in ensuring uh, network neutrality is, is that it leaves open um, the ability for wireless networks, wireless carriers to uh, be free from these rules, these uh, regulations, which do not, or which to be free from regulations that uh, prohibit content blocking of, of some uh, sort. So that's probably the, the, the biggest uh, type of concern there. And still managed services, you know, the last mile, so to speak, is still uh, not within the parameters of these regulations. But uh, we do, of course, have some assurances from the FCC. And I don't know what the FTC has said, but still assurances that that last mile that that the management of the data getting into the the actual end of the wire there will they'll closely monitor that for anti-competitive behavior so uh certainly it's good to see a, a step in this direction but there are plenty of uh legitimate things to to be critical of this uh but it's nice to see a general trend toward the fcc taking an active role especially for those of us who are in principle fa uh, fa in favor of uh the idea of network neutrality yeah, I agree with you there. 
Over on Facebook, we have a page, facebook.com slash thisweekinlaw, where we post up questions before the show as we're getting ready. And uh, I asked whether people thought uh, the FCC went too far or not far enough. The uh, opinion seems to be flowing toward not far enough. Lou Gagliardi says, for example, Comcast can still find ways to charge him tons of uh, extra to use Google Twit and other services. The FCC needed to do more, but unfortunately, politics got in the way, in his opinion. Um, Eric, over there covering the Hollywood beat, have you been hearing different opinions about the new guidelines from the FCC? Uh, well, I think that everyone right now is just waiting to see uh, its impl implementation. Um, it's one thing to put out policies, but it, but the implementation is rather vague. Uh, I guess everyone's waiting to see who is going to be making complaints and, and how the FCC is going to regard those complaints. Right now, uh, I would assume that on, on tenuous uh, legal authority, the FCC is going to be uh, quite careful about how it steps into into these things so um they, they're really inching their their toes a, a little uh, forward here um but but um yeah right now there's not much teeth to uh to these net neutrality rules um and you know there are there are quite a number of people who think they, they go too far so i don't know how this is going to all play out it's it's going to be interesting to watch Right. And speaking of complaints, I'm going to go ahead and drop our tip of the week in early here before the end of the show, because it has to do with lodging net neutrality complaints over at Ars Technica. Matthew Lazar has uh, reproduced and explained the guidelines for filing both informal and formal complaints about what the FCC has done here, its new rules. Um, so if you are interested in really teeing off, if you have something to say about this, um, all the instructions that you need for making your opinion known about net neutrality and uh, how it should develop going forward are right there. And that's our tip of the week. Graham, um, since your perspective is from uh, the lay user in lots and lots of the work that you do, uh, do you have an opinion on net neutrality and, and what is it? Oh, you might be on mute. Uh, I consider go. myself, even though I have trouble figuring out mute buttons sometimes, I consider myself uh, <laughs> more than just an average user. Uh, I mean, I, I, I run a Linux server, I run an Asterix PBX, uh, I design my website in Notepad, you know. Um, that's the way that, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually from uh, essentially what is the old school uh, computer user. Um, and, yeah, uh, I wasn't speaking uh, of you, I was <laughs> really just more of the folks you tend to represent. Uh, as far as the folks I tend to represent have no idea what net neutrality is and, and have really no interest in it m most generally um, I think Should that uh, I mean, is this I've, a more or is this an issue oh. that just gets talked about in our little technology law and policy echo chamber or does it really really matter to people and what, if it does why uh, I can tell you that around here, for, for some reason, issues like this really only matter to the people who are tech savvy. Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, it matters very deeply to me. I, I really believe that, that traffic should basically be unhindered. Um, I think it's very important to keep those channels open for everybody um, and uh, to not limit uh, content. Um, I, I, I think it's very important. I, th I think that uh, most people don't understand what the actual net neutrality is. I mean, people just say it's the internet. You know, I think if Facebook stopped working, people would have problems. Um, but, <laughs> but I really don't think that uh, most of the people are going to notice if their, you know, BitTorrent traffic is going slower than usual. It's the money that concerns me. I mean, just oh, the yeah. ability, as as uh, I mentioned from our commenter in Facebook, to get nickeled and dimed or, you know, 10 and $20 on anything and everything. Uh, oh, Eric, yeah. any thoughts Absolutely. on that front? Eric, you with us? I'm oh, sorry. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the, uh, the economic uh, teeth in... Um, in this whole net neutrality issue that, that you know, aside from uh, whether or not your BitTorrent is gonna run as efficiently, it's, it's, it's not there that I think that you're really gonna get to the hearts and minds of lay people. It's, it's when, you know, they want access to perfectly legitimate legal content, but they find that it gets prohibitively expensive. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the you know the the second uh, some some big company does uh, something that that causes a great deal of notice, uh, there'll be some sort of push to uh, for the FCC to to get involved. And I think that the interesting question is, you know, to what extent is the FCC going to stand by, um, you know, it, its its mandates, its its regs here. You know, uh, you know, they they put they put out something and, and it's been off, uh, off criticized. But but the real question is, you know, how are they going to step up to it to enforce all of this? Uh, I'm sure that that some consumers are, are going to be hurt. But when um, when uh, mobile or, or wireless, um, they do decide to discriminate against against uh, you know, certain types of content and. and um, or even landline, uh, you know, what's what's going to happen, and and is there going to be real enforcement here, and are we going to see companies continuing to fight this in the court, challenging the FCC's authority to to uh, regulate these issues? Uh, I I, uh, I think last year the uh, the FCC w was uh, you know was slapped on the wrist uh, by by the courts, and so so they put out these regs and. and um, you know, it's really questionable whether whether or not they have real authority to do anything about these sorts of issues. You know, right, Denise, exactly. you raise a, you raise a, a great point from the perspective of the consumer or the or the end user, and, it, and it's probably something that doesn't get enough real attention, or is at at least kind of glossed over when we start talking in the in terms of these grand theories of. You know the FCC's jurisdiction and and you know the, the inherent goodness of network neutrality and all of that stuff. But it's this it's the the part of your soul from where or from which that uh, concern comes about the money being nickel and dimed or as you went on to say ten dollar and twenty dollar bill. You know at the at, you know from the internet service provider if you want these premium kind of services. And what I'm wondering is if. Um, if we could attribute some kind of collective mind or collective intention to the uh, industry of that provides us with the the backbone and the infrastructure, you know, the Comcasts and the Earthlinks and the uh, Time Warners and all that stuff, if we could attribute to them as having one intention as to all of this stuff, is that intention, um, you know, adequate, adequately? Um, moderated by the concern that 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 industry would have uh, in terms of the pushback that it would get from its end users, its customers, if when they start to realize that they're being nickel and dimed uh, in all of this, you know, the first stage would be, as Graham said, and that really, you know, hits home for so many people, if if Facebook stopped working because of network discrimination, you know, which is kind of the more accurate way of describing network neutrality issue. You know, mm -hmm. if Facebook stopped working or if you wanted to, you know, this if this Skype conversation became more difficult or, you know, if, uh, right. you know, if eBay became, uh, you know, hard to, to get to, you know, it would not only be a pushback from the end users in the form of unhappy customers complaining about uh, Comcast and you know the they're complaining to Comcast or Time Warner or Earthlink or whomever it may be but there would also be more likelihood of uh, the, the 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 powers that be in Washington both within the administrative agencies like the FCC and maybe the FTC as well and also our, our legislators as well would take more notice of that consumer pushback uh, which we have to believe that the 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 industry the, the internet service provider industry, the network industry has to be aware of how that all of that dynamic would play out, which then leads me to a final thought on this is, you know, w is there really a legitimate concern then that there would be radical content or network uh, discrimination knowing that this mechanism is in place? Is it kind of just an equilibrium that can be there without there being a whole lot of detailed and strong-handed efforts on the part of the FCC uh, to, to implement these things. It's a little bit of a bootstrapping problem. You know, maybe there won't be any regulation because of this fear of the threat of that regulation being present. So maybe there's only a certain point where we really need to go here so that the government isn't micromanaging things. Just some, just some thoughts there. Right. I, I 
I, I just want to say one, one thing uh, on that point. It, I mean, it, it seems to me that we just had a, a big political election where uh, government intrusion was, was uh, very much of an issue. So. Uh, I, I believe that there's a lot of people in uh, in Washington, regardless of the consumer reaction, who who might not be willing to entertain uh, more regulation on, on this front. Even with the consumer backlash, there probably are a lot of lawmakers and politicians who who think that well, the proper recourse would be for uh, customers to to you know cancel their 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 ISPs or sw switch uh, once if they can. I mean if if Comcast is doing something um, uh, th that that's un untarred, uh, you might want to uh, you know uh, react w with your wallet on, on that sort of thing. I know that not all of that is possible, and and there's a you know Byzantine set of uh, telecommunication laws that that may and and antitrust issues that 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 make switching very difficult. But I'm not so sure that a consumer backlash in itself is going to to spur uh, Washington to do much about this issue. Yeah. Well, another instance of uh, the government meddling in people's online lives is the enactment in California of this new law, Section 528.5. Uh, Eric, is this uh, civil code, Section 528.5? No, this is criminal. Criminal code. Okay, so it's actually a crime in California to impersonate another person. And uh, so all those Twitter accounts uh, such as uh, BP and uh, what is it, BP Global PR, that wonderful uh, uh, in the backlash of uh, the big oil spill. And of course, you mentioned Christopher Walken in your piece, uh, Eric. Um, all of these people, if they're uh, subject to uh, this law in California, and of course, um, in the days of the global reach of the internet, that's always an interesting question as well. Um, they, they may actually be subject to criminal charges. Can you tell us about that, Eric? Sure. Well, the, the, new, uh, the new law went into effect uh, on January 1st, and it makes it a crime to, quote, uh, knowingly and without consent, credibly impersonate another person, um, basically uh, for the purposes of harming, intimidating, threatening, or defrauding another person. I guess that the key question is how this is going to be implemented again. Um, does it just target basic identity theft, such as a uh, credit card fraud, or does it go further to prevent uh, cyber harassment? Um, you know, does, does it does it prevent someone from going on Twitter and pretending that they're that they're someone someone else? Uh, and uh, this all raises a, a lot of uh, free speech issues. Uh, but but I, one's got to wonder what the lawmakers had in mind when when they when they put these uh, statutes on the books. Did they they did they really just want to increase the penalties for for doing fraudulent acts? On the other hand, it, it, the, the the statute itself is written so vague that that uh, it, it seems like it can be interpreted very broadly. So that doing something like pretending you're a celebrity is 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 a crime. Um, yeah, you know, and, and it raises a, a lot of uh, issues in terms of you know whether whether you know, parity is protected or not. Uh, very interesting to see how this is uh, going to play out and and and, and see some of the, the first cases that are brought against people under this new uh, malicious impersonation law. Right, it just went into effect as of the first of the year, so we don't know um, how it will be implemented yet, or or how it will come up in. Uh, various prosecutor, prosecutorial um, strategies, but uh, we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Um, I do want to thank our other sponsor here before we get into uh, some more privacy issues after the break, and that is Hover.com, another service that I use and love. I am moving all my domains as they uh, come up for renewal over to Hover. They're managing several of mine now. And uh, I've got to tell you, in an era where um, <laughs> customer service is a kind of a thing of the past and you're constantly on hold and, and trying to figure out how to get uh, just the basic level of service that you need from various providers. Hover is such a breath of fresh air. They have a no hold policy for customer service calls Monday through Friday from 9 to 8 
Eastern. And the good news is you don't need them on customer service very much because they do a very good job of making domain registration and service simple and it just works. Uh, there are email services there. I really, really love their um, email customization where you can set up an email address. You can use a service like Gmail or Yahoo Mail or whatever you might uh, be using and customize it to your own domain or if you don't have a domain that you want to um, link with your email, they'll give you one. You can get uh, a domain for email only without having to actually register a .com. They have a bunch of domains that they have set aside just for that service. Um, it's really wonderful. There's a URL extension service uh, for creating custom URLs for email or uh, for use in social networking type services. Um, to try their domain management service out, Hover makes it easy for you to transfer your existing domains to Hover. That can be a real nightmare, but they will walk you through that transfer. They give you the next steps and track the progress as the URL is transferred. And uh, the transfers are free. Uh, there's a $10 charge to, dom to extend the domain registration for one year past its current expiration date. That's a really good deal. And uh, the who is privacy that goes along with the service is absolutely free. For many people who usually purchase domain privacy with all their domains, this means they will pay much less with Hover. And uh, so if you need a domain or any of these other email or URL related services, de definitely check them out at hover.com. They are good folks. And if you use the offer code TWIL, T-W-I-L, you'll get 10% off. So thank you so much, Hover. We love having you as a sponsor. Um, also in California, folks, uh, there is a new case that uh, has gone ahead, and this is the California Supreme Court this time instead of the legislature and approved the idea that uh, you could be stopped by a police officer who suspects that perhaps you're engaged in some kind of criminal activity. They can pick up your cell phone, browse through the texts, and uh, not need a warrant to, to do that. That's what happened in this case. And uh, the text that they found read 6480. Um, and this in uh, a drug investigation was enough to apparently be used as evidence uh, that it meant that six pills would cost $80. I'm reading some uh, coverage from Ars Technica by Jackie Chang on this. Um, and these, of course, and all the other stories we discuss on the show, you can get in our delicious links, delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 93 for the episode of this show. Um, so the question that I've been getting over and over again, uh, for example, from Zach Glick on Twitter is, okay, so they can, you know, if your cell phone is considered part of the, your immediate environs, it's so much part of your person that they can actually um, look at it without an, a warrant in the course of perhaps arresting you. Uh, what happens if there's a password lock on it? Do you have to give them the password lock? Um, my take on that is uh, that you know the the court didn't go that far, didn't really consider that issue, and uh, that that's a hard question. And I would think that um, in that kind of situation, a warrant would be needed. But I'm curious to get the thoughts of everyone else on this panel. Uh, Graham, what would you uh, think about that situation? Oh, I, I would have loved to have gone last, actually, uh, on this one. Uh, okay, yeah, well, you okay. Can. But, 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 but that's okay. No, that's okay. Uh, because uh, I actually tell uh, a lot of my drug clients that they should have kept their, uh, their drugs in the trunk uh, with a lock on it that the cop could just rip off. Uh, and just for the simple fact that it would create so much headache that we'd never be able to figure out whether or not uh, it, it, was, it was admissible or not. Um, to, to my uh, understanding of it, I mean, they can't just stop you and, and, and look at your cell phone. Uh, they have to have, uh, and they couldn't just stop you and, and frisk you and then pull out your cell phone and see what's on it. They have to actually uh, come and, um, uh, you know, uh, arrest the person, and then they can look at the cell phone. Uh, and uh, for my opinion on it, I think that if it has a lock on it, I think it can't be touched. Uh, it, it's one of those things. The, um, um, the Supreme Court has been fairly clear on that sort of issue. Um, compelling someone to uh, uh, give up a password, I'm not sure how tested that has been. Um, 
but essentially, I mean, I, I would say that uh, I think the uh, uh, the Supreme Court of California kind of misread uh, a little bit uh, of what it is. And, and for me, the biggest problem is I, I, my entire business is on my iPhone uh, and on my iPad. If, if uh, someone took those from me uh, and I didn't have a password lock, they could just simply go through and look at all my business records, and, and that concerns me more than uh, than anything else. I really think that to get past a password they would need a warrant. Evan, what are your thoughts? I don't know the answer or how specifically to answer the question of whether the search would, without a warrant would be lawful if there's a, a password protection there. But I, I'm sure that there is uh, plenty of case law out there under the Fourth Amendment where there have been searches incident to an arrest, which is what we have here in this situation, where there's a mm -hmm. container within the car that is locked or has some kind of, um, uh, you know, protection on it that makes it difficult or requires some ice or some knowledge to, to get into. Um, the thing that is most confounding to me about this decision, and it's, uh, there's, there was a case that came out of Georgia just about a month ago, it came out on December 1st. Um, I forget the defendant's name in there, but it's a Georgia case that came out on December 1st, a, a Supreme Court of Georgia case, or it might have been the appellate court down there, which came to a similar um, conclusion is what this California case did here is that so long as the search of the electronic device is incident to an arrest um, and the, the, there's this exigency that requires the data to be uh, available or to, to be kept um, or to, to be searched without a warrant, then the, the warrantless search is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. We've got to back up here and, and look at it at more generally. What this case holds is not that the police can just have you hand over your cell phone and they be able to search it, you know, right. as you're walking down the street or whatever. You have to be arrested and the search is incident to that. The thing that is most confounding to me is what arises when we start examining what it means or really the, the, the reasoning behind a search incident to an arrest without a warrant being lawful, uh, not unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment, the, the reasoning for that traditionally has been fallen under one of two headings. One, officer safety. We want to make sure that if this guy's got a, a gun on him or a knife on him, the police officer is made aware of that so he doesn't just pull that weapon out and injure or kill the, the officer. The other is the, the main... And I, I think, just to interject, I think that that kind of concern you can leave right out in talking about something like this. Yeah, There's no safety threat from whatever's on somebody's iPhone. But we have this yes. notion of convergence, so maybe somebody will write an app that will turn their device into a taser. So leaving <laughs> that, leaving that uh, contingency aside, the other one is the destruction of evidence, the, the risk of destruction of evidence. And that seems to be... Um, you know, perhaps more of a realistic concern here. What what the courts have held is that it's okay to do this search of a of a container or uh, or you know just the, the search of the person and his immediate surroundings at the time of the arrest is because they don't want him to throw the drugs out the window or swallow the drugs or um, you know do whatever, throw the gun away, what whatever. Um, that concern seems to be a little bit less here, um, but. With the, and I'm wondering how much the whole question of whether or not there's a password protecting the device would, would play into that. I don't see much of a concern of evidence being destroyed off of a phone if the police have already confiscated it from the person. And then in this case, this Diaz case from California that we're talking about, and also the case from Georgia, I forget the defendant's name, that it was not an issue in either one of those cases as to whether the police had wrongfully... Uh, confiscated the phone, seized the phone in the first instance. So uh, my gut feeling and just a real sense of, about this, even before I start going into the nuances of the Fourth Amendment analysis, is that neither of those real exigent concerns are, are here. There's, mm -hmm. no, there's no risk of, of injury to the officer that we were talking about here. And unless, you know, there's some kind of real... Uh, uh, kind of technology that not a lot of people use that would be able to, re, you know, s remotely delete evidence off of the device. Once it's in police custody and the person can't, you know, actually get on there and start messing with stuff anymore, I don't see much of a risk of the destruction of data. So for me, well, these it, cases are if they, 
If Go they ahead. seized my iPhone, I could remotely wipe it. Um, I mean, uh, th that's just one thing. Or I could tell somebody to do it. I could have my, you know, my secretary. I could tell her just go ahead and wipe it as soon as I get arrested. Um, but I, I think what really interests me about this whole thing is the different levels of where you can go. There's a text message, and then there's accessing servers through the phone, and then there's going. It's just as far as you can go. Um, and those levels seem to be, uh, to me, what's going to be the most important when it comes to uh, the courts making these decisions. I mean, honestly, all the courts are kind of clueless when it comes to uh, uh, this stuff. We're using old law to uh, uh, try to, you know, encapsulate new technology, uh, and that doesn't work out very well. Eric, any thoughts on this one before we move on to our final story of the week? Well, I'm not a big expert on the on the Fourth Amendment law, but I'm very confused by by why. Uh, the, the courts, why the, the California Supreme Court uh, said that a warrant wasn't needed uh, uh, to, to access someone's text messages. And I, don't, I don't see the, uh, the threat uh, that I, I think that, that there, sh you know, there should be a warrant on this. And I, especially going back to the original question, I mean, I, I, I can't see any reason why, why the police should be able to compel someone to turn over uh, their password to unlock something. Uh, you have a Fifth Amendment right not to uh, incriminate yourself to, to stay silent. I guess the, the, the big question is, you know, if, uh, if the police uh, have hackers under, the, uh, under their payroll, you know, can, can they hack into uh, your cell phone and get your text messages? Um, but, but over Overall, I mean, I I think the one of the other stories that that uh, we're, we're following or, or may just to be about to discuss is that that the the courts in in, in other jurisdictions have said that uh, that the um, law enforcement authority definitely need a warrant for for email. So what's the real difference between email and and text messages? Right, exactly. Um, Graham, hey, I have a question that arises out of our IRC uh, from Beatmaster there. Going back to your, your thought that if you were arrested, you could have someone wipe the device remotely. Uh, wouldn't you be concerned in that situation about spoliation of evidence and, and further criminal charges? <laughs> Uh, well, I certainly would, but uh, I mean, if I were a, and of course I could never advise a client to do such a thing, but mm -hmm. if I were a, a client facing a murder charge and there was a text message on my, uh, on my phone, I think I'd rather be charged with uh, destruction of evidence than um, with, uh, you know, murder. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure what else to say about that. Yeah, pretty practical concern there. All right, uh, last story of the week. Uh, apparently, Twitter has started contributing its DMCA takedown letters to Chilling Effects, uh, chillingeffects.org, which aggregates those things and uh, makes them public and lets people sort of take them apart and look at them. And they've gotten, as of uh, December 15th, 2010, uh, 11,500 total takedown uh, notices. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's uh, chilling effects as well from contributors like Google, Yahoo, and Dig. Um, so now they're getting them from Twitter as well. And one of the complaints um, on the order of 300 takedown notices in uh, just the last month is um, the fact that people are po pointing to infringing sites from Twitter. Um, so it's it's trying to be a grokster problem here, the Supreme Court case from several years back, where um, there could be uh, liability against the provider here, Twitter, for having a platform that is valuable because it induces people to infringe. And uh, if people are using Twitter just to um, point to things that uh, are otherwise illegal on the web, then uh, there's possibly a liability concern for Twitter, and that's why they're trying to avail themselves of the DMCA safe harbors. Um, the headline on this from uh, Liz Gans at All Things Digital was, how much, how much copyright infringement can you cram into a single tweet, which uh, I just love. And uh, Evan, what's your take on this? Yeah, um, I, I don't know if we need to really make it into a Grokster problem, if we need to go quite that far, because it would seem to, from Twitter's perspective, that it just needs to be concerned, you know, in a traditional secondary liability analysis, mm -hmm. even short of Grokster, which, you know, the holding of Grokster is that you can be secondarily liable if the object of your device is to 
uh, promote the infringement occasioned by others. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. even a smaller subset of just this ordinary secondary infringement liability analysis. So Twitter obviously is doing the right thing. Um, I think the DMCA is very clear, uh, certainly not uh, intentionally, because of course the DMCA was signed into law by President Clinton way back in 1998, some eight years before Twitter was even uh, launched, but mm -hmm. it does provide protections for, um, uh, how, what does the DMCA say? It's section 512D, which provides safe harbor protection for information location tools, which would be, you know, when the DMCA was written, they were thinking about uh, Yahoo and, and sure. uh, you know, other, what was it, Webcrawler and Lycos and Alta Vista, you know, those going back <laughs> exactly. to those great great days excite at uh, home yeah that's right that's right um it, but in, in this sense and the way that the, these people are, are using twitter really does make it an information location tool it has the search functionality you know ostensibly one would follow a particular account you know to help it find to help the user locate uh, purportedly infringing materials so you know twitter of course is doing the right thing by uh, position, positioning itself to be in the, the DMCA safe harbors here because I think there could be a real risk uh, that given the right facts, if especially if it starts to, to monetize things even more, uh, however that you know whole thing is going to go of Twitter developing a revenue model based on somehow tied to, to the content go, going through it, there really is a, a concern that it could have about secondary infringement liability. And so um, you know, it's doing the right thing by, by following the DMCA. It's probably also doing the right thing by making sure that there is the, uh, the, the, the openness with all of this and sending all this stuff over to our uh, to Twill's friend, Wendy Seltzer, over at Chilling mm -hmm. Effects uh, mm -hmm. and, and seeing that these things are, are um, we, can, we can keep the, the reasonability of them all in check or the reasonableness right, of these exactly. all in check. Eric, do you think that this is... Um a, a feasible business strategy for folks who are seeking to control their content online to monitor Twitter and try to take down individual tweets? I, I, I actually think that it's a very necessary thing mm -hmm. for, for content holders to do. I, I don't see what uh, the position that Twitter is in it to be any different than the position that, that say Google is in, um, you know, Google. If you, if you search uh, for for torrents on Google, you'll you'll be directed to to various cyber lock lockers. So really, the question is linking, um, and the uh, yeah, I agree that that there is uh, the question is all about secondary liability uh, inducement uh, to 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 copyright infringement. Uh, th that sort of thing, which is a very big open question. Uh, there have been uh, court cases involving Perfect Ten in California, and and, and all that. Um, I and, and I believe that this is 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 going to be a, a much much bigger issue. I, I we we've seen a lot of content holders in the past year target businesses who who are enabling. Uh, piracy sites. Uh, I've reported about about uh, big content holders going going after advertisers, for instance, uh, on piracy sites. Uh, companies that that aggregate and and link to 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 pirate web, um, to websites that ho host uh, copyright infringement content are 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 certainly in the purview uh, of these content holders. So so I, I'm not surprised at all that that we're starting to see takedown notices sent to to Twitter. Um, there, I think that they're the same things as the and take down notices that are going out to, to Google. Uh, is it's just uh, primary. The the question really is about liability in terms of linking. Graham, any uh, desire to chime in on this? Uh, sure. I, when I first heard about the BitTorrent protocol, I was actually uh, doing a, um, a, a basically a. a final class project uh, in law school uh, and uh, I thought it was going to be a game changer basically all the different people that are involved uh, you know all the different protocols and the just the, the swarm basically and the seeds uh, and uh, basically I was trying to think of a way where someone in the whole loop might not be responsible for the copyright infringement and uh, basically it looks like everybody who touches a seed or a swarm can be liable for copyright infringement um, and subject to the uh, you know the DCMA and I really wish that the uh, um, uh, 
you know, the people who are actually being, uh, or the USCG and Dunlap Grub and Weaver and, and the, you know, those whole groups that are actually out pursuing individuals would instead, you know, try to use those DCMA and notices, uh, you know, or DMCA notices, sorry, and, uh, you know, do everything, uh, you know, along those routes instead of the, uh, um, the other things. So um, I really think that it, they should be pursuing those lines, not the, uh, not the kind of just, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens and, you know, see who we can get sort of mentality. And I wish that they'd, uh, you know, abide by those rules. And uh, uh, I think that that would make things more courteous on uh, their side. But everybody who touches a swarm can be, uh, you know, um, in trouble for this. And Eric, I think you raised that, that concern, didn't you, in an article you wrote this past summer where uh, you opined as to whether there would be any difficulties in establishing a prima facie case of infringement against a BitTorrent user because of the nature of the, the BitTorrent architecture, right? I mean, each little person is only dealing with a little part of the file at any given time. So I think it is a, an interesting question. I think it's one that we can get to uh, an answer to, to, to not have much doubt that there is uh, liability for infringement just by participating in a BitTorrent swarm. But Am I mistaken that you brought something like that? You raised some concern, or yeah. at least uh, raised that as a, as a question earlier when these when these things first started happening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, back ten years ago, we, when we were discussing things like Napster, everything was uh, comparatively very simple. You know, you you had. Uh, you know, a, a file. You uploaded a file. You downloaded a file. These days, uh, mm -hmm. things are, are are not at all. You're you're you know participating in a swarm, and um, you know uh, if you speak to uh, Dunlop Grub about it, they they think that 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 makes people even more liable for for what's going on because they they are enabling uh, uh, everything. Um, on the other hand, yes, you can also take the view that you're only uh, um, partly liable because you're only dealing with with a few data packs at, at, at a certain time so uh there's a lot of really interesting fascinating questions uh to be explored uh in, in future cases right we'll have to see if any of those uh many many BitTorrent related lawsuits that are being pursued uh get beyond the settlement stage and into the part where we might actually see some addressing of those issues and I'd like to make a public apology to Jeff Weaver, if I might, from Dunlap Grub and Weaver. I, I, I really did write that email in a in a in a bad frame of mind, and I I am very sorry about that. There's my public apology. Um, uh, that's, that's all you'll get. I'll be civil. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope he watches and or listens. <laughs> um, for uh, our resource of the week uh, was written by. A uh, friend and uh, frequent panelist on the show, Jonathan Bailey from Plagiarism Today. But here he's writing over at Freelance Writing Jobs. And he has a list of five legal concerns for freelancers to watch in 2011, such as social media law, orphan works, stock photo litigation, newspapers, and uh, privacy on the web. So um, go check those out. So many people are doing so much freelance kind of stuff these days uh, that I wanted to put that out there because they're great tips um, if you are engaged in that kind of activity. So thank you, Jonathan, for our resource of the week. And uh, we've all survived, I guess, uh, one of the biggest Twitter memes I've seen this week, the less impressive movies that struck like a storm of uh, bad humor a couple of nights ago. Um, so we can all be thankful for that and uh, wish everybody a great time in the next several days at CES. And uh, I uh, want to say thank you to all of you for joining us on the show, Evan. Great to have you here with us again. It's great to be here. Thanks. Uh, I think we're off to a great start for this new year. This has been a, a wonderful uh, show. So uh, really, uh, really appreciate uh, being here as always. Thank you. My pleasure. Folks, find Evan at internetcases.com and internetcases on Twitter. Graham, wonderful to have you join us. Thanks so much for your insights. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. Let's let these people watch some CES coverage, huh? Absolutely, yes. I know that's what I'm going to do shortly. Uh, folks can find Graham at cipher.com, and you are also ciphered on Twitter. Is that right? Uh, that is right. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't ever really use it very much. Right, right now I, I spend too much time fiddling. But S Y F E R T, yeah. E R T. Thanks so much. Great to have you on. And Eric, great to have you back. 
Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here in the new year, and uh, I look forward to uh, listening to your shows uh, and this coming year. You do great work. Thank you, and you do great work over at the Hollywood Reporter Esquire. Really, really love the stuff that you do there. Wonderful insights and just nonstop coverage of all things related to entertainment, media, and the law. So thanks so much for that. And uh, you are Eric with a Q, Gardner with a D on Twitter. So folks can yes. uh, please find and follow Eric there. And with that, we will see you next week for the next episode of This Week in Law. Thanks all.